In this video, we're going to discuss thermodynamic systems, heat and work, as well as pressure volume diagrams. So to start, a thermodynamic system is essentially what we are interested in. So anytime you're reading a passage on the exam or looking at a question stem, they're always gonna to refer to something of interest, an organism, a container of gas, right? Whatever they're referring to is the system. And by definition, everything else is what we call the surroundings. Now, it's important to be able to define the system and the surroundings because a lot of the thermodynamic laws that we were referring to earlier, such as first law of thermodynamics and second law of thermodynamics, they're looking at energy and entropy in the entire universe. But typically, when we're studying physics or chemistry, we're only interested in a very small part of the universe, the system we're interested in. And when you're looking at just the system, you can't apply the laws completely. So what I mean by that is you can't look at a system and say that within a system, it can't gain or lose, temp uh, can't gain or lose energy, right? Systems can gain energy. Systems can become more disordered or less disordered. So when we're talking about conservation of energy, we're talking about in the total universe, you can't gain or lose energy. So instead, when we're looking at systems, if our system is gaining energy, that means the energy is coming from the surroundings into the system. So energy is not being created, it's really just being transferred. All right, so in terms of how energy can be transferred, it can be done through heat and work. And we can represent that with this equation right here, delta E equals Q plus W. E here represents the energy of the system. So your system can either gain energy or it can lose energy. And for MCAT, it's important to know that the energy of a system is directly proportional to its temperature. So we can use a temperature as a readout to determine whether our system gained energy or lost energy. Q stands for heat and W stands for work. So let's go ahead and start by looking at heat. So with heat, one of two things can happen. Heat can flow into the system, or heat can flow out of the system. And for these two processes, heat flowing in or heat flowing out, we want to be able to assign a sign to Q. Q is either going to be positive or Q is going to be negative. And to figure that out, we can look at this equation. If heat flows into the system, then our system should be gaining energy. And in order for our system to gain energy, Q should be a positive value. So that means when heat flows into the system, Q is positive. And conversely, if heat flows out of our system, then Q is negative. That would give us a decrease in the change in energy. For work, it's a little bit more complicated, right? Work doesn't just flow in or out, right, like heat. So for work, what you actually want to pay attention to is volume. So work involves a change in volume. And if now we know that work involves a change in volume, well, we know that one of two things can happen to volume. The volume can increase or the volume can decrease. So which one of these would increase the energy of our system and which one would decrease the energy of our system? Well, when the volume increases, your system is pushing out. Right? The volume increases because the molecules in your system are pushing out to expand the system. And when your system is pushing out, it has to expend energy to increase the volume. So that means when your volume is increasing, your system is expending energy, so the energy of the system should decrease. So that means a change in volume involves a decrease uh, in energy, so W has to be negative. So we can say here, if the change in volume is positive, then the system does work. 
And as a consequence of the system doing work, work is negative, so the system loses energy. The opposite would be if the volume decreases. The volume of your system would decrease if your surroundings is doing work to compress your system. So here we say that the surroundings does work on the system. And when the surroundings does work on the system, your system gains energy. In this situation, work is positive. All right. So what you want to pay attention to then on the exam is when they're talking about physical processes, you want to think about the direction of heat and the change in volume for work in order to determine how that affects the energy of a system. All right. The next thing I want to look at then is pressure volume diagrams. So when the heat and work is changing in a system, that's going to affect the pressure and volume of a system. We can represent these differences using a pressure volume diagram. And when we're drawing pressure volume diagrams, there's four different types of graphs we can see depending on the type of process that has occurred. Isobaric, isochoric, isothermal, or adiabatic. So we're gonna go through each of these one by one. An isobaric process is a process that occurs under constant pressure. So for example, this would be a situation where you have a pressure volume diagram and your pressure cannot change. So if your pressure cannot change, you have to think about, well, if your system gains energy, what could possibly change? Well, here, of course, it has to be the volume, but how? Well, consider, for instance, a piston with gas molecules inside. If heat flows into the system, then you, the gas molecules inside the system are moving faster. They're colliding more frequently and with stronger collisions against the walls of the container. That exerts a greater pressure on the inside, and that greater pressure inside will push the piston up increasing the volume of the system. So an isobaric process on a PV diagram is a horizontal line. You can have a change in volume, but the pressure cannot change. Now, another piece of information you want to be able to extract from PV diagrams is the amount of work done. Now, work we've discussed before is force times displacement. But pressure, you'll recall, is force over area. If you actually substitute in force as pressure times area into our work equation, you'll actually get the following, where work is equal to pressure times the change in volume. So this equation is actually pretty handy because if you look at this equation in this graph, you'll notice that this is simply just describing the area under our graph. Because pressure, that's our y-axis, change in volume, that's essentially the x-axis. So something else very important to know for the MCAT is that work is the area under the PV curve. All right, so that's isobaric processes. Next, we can consider isochoric processes. Isochoric means constant volume. So the volume cannot change. Now, if the volume cannot change, there should be something you should be thinking of immediately, and that is work. Work involves a change in volume. So if the volume here is constant, that means that work cannot be done. So for isochoric processes, work is zero, and the change in the energy of the system is simply equal to the heat flow. So if heat flows into the system, our system gains energy. If heat flows out of the system, then our system loses energy. So for instance, if we consider a situation where we have a piston where the piston is locked in place. It can't move up or down, so the volume is constant. 
if heat flows into the system, the heat will increase the temperature. And with a higher temperature, the gas molecules have stronger and more collisions, which will increase the pressure. And that's essentially what happens in an isochoric process. The volume stays the same, and the pressure changes. And what you can also appreciate is when you look at the PV curve for an isochoric process, since it's a vertical line, there is no area under this graph corresponds with the fact that work cannot be done in isochoric processes. Okay, so now let's take a look at isothermal processes. Isothermal means constant temperature. So throughout the entire process, the temperature does not change. Again, you should be making a connection here because temperature is directly proportional to the energy of the system. So if temperature doesn't change, that means the energy of the system also does not change. So that means the change in energy is equal to zero. So it also means Q plus W has to equal zero. So that would mean Q is equal to negative W. Whatever amount of energy is gained or lost by heat, the opposite happens to work. So for instance, if 100 joules of energy flowed in by heat, then your system would expend 100 joules of energy by doing work. Now, how can we draw out an isothermic process on a PV diagram? Well, in an isothermic process, you can have a change in the volume. For instance, if your volume increases, we have to think about what does that do to the pressure? Well, when the volume changes, the temperature doesn't. So your molecules are still moving with the same speed as before. So at first you might think, oh, that doesn't change the pressure. But just because your molecules are moving with the same speed doesn't mean the pressure doesn't change. In fact, if you increase the volume, your molecules now have to travel a greater distance to reach one side of the container or to get from one side of the container to the other side of the container. So since it has to travel farther per collision, there will be fewer collisions of gas particles against the walls of the container, which results in decreased pressure. So here, if the volume increases, the pressure has to decrease. So we actually end up with this curved line. And the fact that this is a curved line actually shouldn't be too surprising because if you recall from the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. When moles in the gas content are constant, then the product of pressure and volume are directly proportional to temperature. So if you increase volume, the pressure has to decrease, and conversely, if you increase the pressure, the volume has to decrease. Another important consequence of this is, in this case, this is what we call an isotherm. Every point along this line is an isotherm, and it's possible for us to draw more isotherms. So this red line is another isotherm, this green line is another isotherm. They all represent different temperatures. And for the MCAT, you should be able to recognize which ones are at higher temperature and which ones that are at lower temperature. So if we call this T1 in red, T2 in blue, and T3 in green, we should be able to rank these from lowest to highest temperature. And the ranking is T1 is the lowest, then T2, then T3. And the reason why is because the product of pressure and volume is directly proportional to temperature. So the green line, these will have the largest pressure and volume values. So they'll have the largest product giving the highest temperature. The red line has the smallest pressure and volume values and will give the lowest temperature values. So in other words, on a PV diagram, temperature can actually be read as going up and to the right on the graph. Okay, so the last one we need to talk about are adiabatic processes. Adiabatic processes is where there is no 
heat transfer. In order for there to be no heat transfer, there generally has to be one of two requirements. So one possibility is you have an insulated system. So if it's insulated, that means heat cannot enter or exit. But insulated systems aren't very common in biology. So the other option is if you have a very fast process where the work done is so fast that there is no time for heat to flow in or out of the system. This is actually the case for the majority of adiabatic processes, that they're just extremely fast, so there's no time for heat flow. So if heat transfer cannot occur, that means Q is equal to zero. It also means the change in energy is equal to W. Now, one of the consequences of the fact that Q is equal to zero means that there's nothing to oppose the effects of work. So if the system does work, our system has to lose energy. If work is done on our system, our system has to gain energy. And since the energy changes, that means the temperature changes. So important thing to know is that for an adiabatic process, you cannot reside on an isotherm. Because if you're on an isotherm, that would mean that the temperature does not change. But instead, what you actually see, and we can go ahead and draw a couple isotherms. So this would be T1, and this would be T2. This is two different isotherms. When we look at an adiabatic process, if we want to increase the volume, so this would be V0, and this would be Vf, that would be accompanied by a decrease in the pressure. But the decrease in the pressure is actually more significant than an isothermal process. In an isothermal process, when the volume expands, your molecules are still moving at the same speed. So the pressure drops just because it takes longer for molecules to get from one side of the container to the other side of the container. In an adiabatic process, if the volume increases, it's because your system did work to push the volume larger. And if your system does work, it has to expend energy, so the temperature drops. So not only do you have a larger volume, your molecules are moving more slowly, so you have a larger drop in the pressure. So when we look at an adiabatic curve, we should take note that you are moving from one isotherm to another, and the graph is steeper than an isotherm. So we're going to make a note here that the PV curve is steeper than an isotherm. OK. So these are the four different thermodynamic processes, isobaric, isochoric, isothermal, and adiabatic, and how we can represent these processes on PV diagrams and also be able to relate them to energy, heat, and work.